Hi, this is Sean Perrin, and you're listening to episode 47 of the Clarinet Podcast, the show where I discuss all that's new and neat with clarinet with the neatest people in the industry. In today's episode, I want to take a look back at the top 10 moments from the 2016 Clarinet Podcast season. Now, it's really interesting because listening back to these, I, I noticed a couple things. And the first one was that the audio quality has improved very much over time. So I just want to apologize for some of the earlier episodes. Please have patience as I sort of learned what I was doing, to be honest. And the second thing is my interview style really changed. I feel like over the course of the year, I sort of found my voice, um, was able to be myself a little bit more, and got a lot more comfortable with this whole thing. I want to thank those of you who've been here from the very beginning. Um, this was just an idea I had about a year ago, and since then, I have taken it on the road four times to Kansas, um, Montreal, Canada, Penticton, BC, and uh, Vancouver, BC. And you know what? I also went to Chicago, so I guess five times. It's just been an amazing journey. I've got to speak to so many great people. I've met so many great people. I've received so many fantastic messages of people who really have enjoyed listening to this content. And it's such an honor to produce it every week and to have the chance to work on it and do this. I, I've really enjoyed this journey. I hope you enjoy this recap episode of the top 10 favorite moments from the year. And I also hope you tune in starting on Thursday, February 16th for the beginning of season two, which will kick off with an episode from Eric Salazar, who actually was featured first in episode eight of the podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And this episode, as always, was brought to you by Daddario Woodwinds. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, Diderio is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques, so you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from Diderio Woodwinds, visit diderio.com slash woodwinds. The first moment I'd like to reflect back on from 2016 was when Michael Norsworthy shared what it was like having his first lesson with Cal Opperman. Now, this story was made even more interesting when Josh Redman shared a similar story many, many episodes later. But at the time, I absolutely couldn't believe what I was hearing. I thought it was funny, compelling, and just so, in a way, bizarre, but yet understandable at the same time. I'd heard that Cal Opperman was a really passionate teacher, but the story that ensued, I just, I couldn't have imagined in my wildest dreams. And I can't imagine what it was like to have lived through it. I want to thank Michael for absolutely being interested and cooperative with this idea from the very beginning. He was, of course, one of the first guests, and there was nothing to compare it to. The podcast didn't exist yet, but he put a whole lot of faith in the idea, thought it was fantastic, and just rolled with it. And it was it remains one of the most popular episodes, not just in download numbers, but also for its content. People really, really love the stories that he shared. And having him featured here actually reminds me that I really need to have him back for a, a round two, which we sort of did discuss towards the end of this episode. Here's Michael Norsworthy from episode two, sharing what it was like having his first lesson with Cal Opperman. You studied with Kalman Opperman. Could mm -hmm. you tell us a story about working with him? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> sounds like there are many. <laughs> there, there, there are many. Um, my, my favorite though, um, is actually the story of my first lesson. Um, I, was an, I was a graduate student at New England Conservatory and Richard Stoltzman sent me down to Cal Opperman um, to have some lessons to, you know, properly build my technique and, and other things. And so, <clears throat> um, so I showed up, I drove down from New York. I left at eight, or rather drove to New York from Boston. I left at eight o'clock in the morning and I got there around 1130. Well, my lesson was at noon. So I parked and I got a cup of coffee and, and then I went up to the door and there was a note taped to the door and it says, dear Mr. Norsworthy, went for a walk. Be back shortly, Mr. Opperman. <laughs> and so I waited and, you know, about 10 minutes after 12, he came back and and his wife, Louise, was with him. Um, they went on a walk every day. Um, so, And he lived in the basement apartment. Um, and when we walked in to the apartment, the entire apartment was filled from floor to ceiling with clarinet stuff. Oh, wow. Like I mean, barrels, mouthpieces, tools, workbenches, 
you know, sheet music, books. I mean, you, you, you've, you've never seen so much clarinet stuff in your entire life. So, so I sat down and um, <clears throat> I took my clarinet out. He looked at my instrument first, to, you know, to make sure that I think everything was in good working order. So, uh, so I sat down and he said, okay, play a chromatic scale. So I played a chromatic scale very quickly. And he said, no, 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 go, go very slowly. So I, I got about four notes in, and he said, okay, you have no idea what you're doing, do you? <laughs> <clears throat> and I said, well, you know, I'm a graduate student at Richard Stoltzman's, and I've, I've played professionally in the world for the past few years, and <laughs> I, I, I think I have somewhat of a clue. And he said, well, that's where you're wrong. <clears throat> so <Wow. laughs> we began the, the very arduous process of, of you know, build, ripping you down and then consequently building you back up again, which was sort of a style of teaching. But my first lesson, I was there for a total of 11 and a half hours. Sorry, 11 or one and a half? 11. 11 and a half. And a half hours. I arrived at noon and I left at around 1130 at night. Um, and during that time, we had probably played for seven or eight hours mm -hmm. um, from books that he had written, from certain etudes that he were th that he thought were important. We did a Bach, uh, uh, one of the Bach partitas um, for, from the, the sonatas and partitas for violin, and he made a couple of barrels for me, and he made a mouthpiece for me, just like that, just like that. Um, wow. It took it took him about four minutes to make a barrel and it took him even less time to make a mouthpiece um and it was by far the most incredible equipment that i had ever played on um you and, still have uh, those items i still have them i will never get rid of them i have many of them now <laughs> wow so um so um but so i left at eleven thirty, which means that i didn't get home to boston until about three o'clock in the morning mm-hmm and my phone rang at 6.30. And I answered, you know, I'm like, hello. He says, hello, hello, it's Mr. Opperman. And I said, oh, oh, um, um, did, I, did I forget something at your house? I'm, I'm, I'm some re really sorry. He said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm just calling to see if you're practicing. At 6 a.m. after just having the all-day lesson? And I said, um, it's... 6.30, and I just got home at 3 o'clock, so n no, I'm, sh should I be practicing? He said, <laughs> you, should, you should practice. You should, you should get up and you should do your scales before you go to the bathroom. And I said, okay, you know, I'll I thought, well, if I just say okay and, you know, and I agree with him, then I can get him off the phone. He wants to hear. <clears throat> and, uh, and I said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll get up and practice. And he said, okay, I'll call you back in 10 minutes. Wow. <laughs> And so I called, he called back in 10 minutes. I mean, 10 minutes on the nose. And I played for him for three hours on the phone. This is the very so next day. The very next day, I had, I had had maybe three hours of sleep. And that was, that was assuming that I had gone to bed and, my, and went to sleep as soon as my head hit the pillow. My but, God, that's, this but, sounds crazy. <laughs> How long did you study with him for? I studied with him only for about a year and a half or maybe two years. I mean, and it was sporadic. I mean, sometimes I would go down once a week. Sometimes I would go down once a month. Um, you know, I think I had probably a total of maybe 20 lessons with him or something. Um, but 20 lessons was not 20 hours. 20, 20 lessons <laughs> was, was more like 100 hours. Wow. Um, and, uh, and he was very good to me. Um, and the highest compliment I have ever gotten is when a student uh, who was studying with him said that they were thinking of coming up to Boston and they knew me and what he's, and he actually said to the student, according to the student, I never heard this come out of Cal's mouth, but, but he, he apparently said, well, that's a good idea. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> so it went full circle. And that for me was the highest compliment I have ever been given in my life. Um, and so, uh, because he really was, he was somebody who was just a, you know, sort of a master teacher in, and not even just a teacher. He was, he was a master mentor. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he made you, he made you want to do it all the time. He made you constantly want to improve. He, 
he was inspiring and he was relentless. Um, and some people had a problem with his, you know, with his being relentless. And I never did because I think I was just as obsessed as he was. Um, and he was very fond of telling us, you know, he said, you know, this is not my hobby. I've been doing this for 75 years. Yeah. And, and it's, it's the God's honest truth. He had been doing it for 75 years and, and it's all he did. He was completely and totally obsessed with what he did. The way Michael described Cal Opperman's love and reverence for the clarinet was something that I heard later for the bass clarinet when I got the chance to speak to the legendary Harry Sparnai in episode 20. Harry shared the story of how he got started not only with the bass clarinet, but with music itself. And I felt that this touching story just absolutely had to be included in a top 10 best moments from 2016. I hope you enjoy Harry Sparnai sharing what it was like for him to encounter not only the bass clarinet, but music for the first time. Listen, my beginning was a little bit different because when the, I was young, you, you know that, you read the book, uh, I played saxophone, the tenor, tenor saxophone. And when I wanted to be a musician, my father said, okay, you have to study at the conservatory because there are enough street musicians. I want that you study. Okay, and I go to the conservatory. But at that time, the saxophone was completely forbidden. It was a dirty instrument. It was, yeah, I, we are speaking about 1960, eh? 1960. Yeah. Now, now the saxophone is accepted in all the places, but at, not in my time. No man, no man, not at all. So I came there with my saxophone <laughs> and they looked at me very, very strange. And they said, but what, 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 what are you playing? And I said, um, I want to play, uh, uh, well, you needn't from Thelonious Monk. Mm -hmm. And they said, what? And I was playing and the tenor sax and I made an uh, improvisation, blah, blah, blah. And nobody, <laughs> nobody wanted to have me. Only one guy. And that was the playing professor. He said, yes, I want that, that guy. I want that. And he told, he spoke with me and he said, uh, yeah, but you have to speak. You have to uh, uh, play clarinet. But don't worry. That's also good for your saxophone technique. And I said, okay, no problem. I wanted to be a musician. So I started clarinet. But I always missed the sound of the, sax the, the tenor saxophone. So I was practicing more and more and more and more, and life changed. I started playing more clarinet, always more contemporary pieces than the classical pieces. I remember one time I was playing Weber, and my professor looked at me and he said to me, you don't like it, eh? And I said, no, I don't like it at all, I'm sorry. And he said to me, yes, but you have to practice it. Is that okay? No problem. But you don't need to play it. Oh, say, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so you really think, did, did your father's encouragement then to seek formal training, how did that shape your career then? How is it different than it would have been? Oh, I think it would have been completely different because my idea was working, for example, in a, in a shop and in the evening playing in a jazz club or with friends, etc., etc. No, it should have been completely different, completely different. But now I want to uh, uh, go on with the, the, at the end of the study, I had already two uh, degrees for the normal clarinet. And then my professor came with a big case. And I thought, hey, a saxophone, what is this? And then he opened and there was a bass clarinet. And he was a fantastic professor. I loved him. Rui Otto, he was fantastic. And he said uh, to all the students who were, oh, you can blow a little bit. And everybody was blowing a little bit and everybody had a problem. And believe me or not, you can ask him. He is still alive. He is 93. Wow. I played three, four notes. I looked at him and I said, yes, but this is the instrument I want to play. And he looked at me and he said, oh, no, Harry, please don't do this. Don't, <laughs> <laughs> don't do this. You cannot earn your money. Please don't. Yes, I want to play this instrument. I'm sorry. So I finished my uh, last degree for normal playing that. I closed my cases. And then uh, I had to sell my uh, tenor saxophone to buy a bass playing it. And then uh, I started. It was 1967 or 66. Yeah. But you were, so, you were so sure. <laughs> so you were so sure about the, the bass clarinet that you sold your beloved tenor sax, though. Yeah, that was, yeah, that, yeah. But, but I have him back, eh? I have him back now. <laughs> oh, you have one again? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 
So what is it about the deep, rich tone that really draws you to those instruments? Like you say that even when you were playing clarinet, like you kind of missed that part about the tenor sax and then bass clarinet was just the best of both worlds. So oh, what is it? Yeah, it is not only the lower, lower note. It is the, some of, uh, the, the possibilities from all the registers. Listen to the bass clarinet. Mm-hmm. We can do, for example, I don't know... Um, uh, if you know the clarinet solitude by Yoyo Yuasa, it's a Japanese composer. It is a beautiful piece, but it is for clarinet, original for clarinet, and it is going up to the high E flat, there's above the high C, yes? Yes. So the so four, four ledger lines. Many, I don't know how many lines, but uh, a lot, yeah? Are we talking the, the C uh, above super, sorry, the E flat above super C? Yeah, the super C, yeah. So this is so like... That is with, uh, I don't know, uh, the E flat, I think with eight lines or nine lines or something like that. My God. That, that, that E flat, I mean. Mm-hmm. So when I ask you, ask you to play that E flat, you will not be very happy. I will run screaming. <laughs> yeah. and, and when I ask you, please, not only you have to play that E flat, but you have to play it also pianissimo. I think you want to kill me. <laughs> okay, now the bass clarinet. We can do anything. I can play that E flat and even a lot higher, but I can play that E flat fortissimo, but I also can play it pianissimo. And in the low register, I can play the low C fortissimo, but I can play it so soft that you only feel nearly the, the, the fibra- vibrations. So not one instrument can do that. Not the contrabassoon who is playing the low notes. They never can play pianissimo so soft in a low register as we can. Mm-hmm. And a normal clarinet never can play so soft in the high register as we can. So the bass clarinet can do, in fact, I must be honest, everything. We have a practice. We can, but we can do anything. Anything what you want, we can do it. So let's go back to when you were a student for a second. I mean, really early. Um, back to that day when your parents bought you that saxophone. Y- yeah. Your mom said she went out for the afternoon and left you at home with this saxophone. And when they came home, you were playing. What, what were those few hours like? I, I, fantastic. Oh, I lo- oh, I feel still I get the feeling. I opened the case and I saw the saxophone. I knew a little bit about the mouse piece and the reed, not from the saxophone, because I had a, a, a young uh, a friend who played the clarinet in a harmony band. And so I knew and I was trying this and, and uh, you don't need to be very intelligent to know uh, when you see the piano also you go up, etc. So I saw the keys and I think, okay, I have to close the keys and I did it in my mouse and I start blowing, of course, completely wrong. So no turning uh, right, but I was blowing and there came a note. So I, okay, hey, that's lovely. And then I close the key. Hey, that's a lower note. That is ah. So that when I close the key, that's okay. So, and that was going on. And then after three, four hours, I played, oh yeah, I never forget that. And, and a tune very popular in that uh, period, it, it was called Tequila. Oh yes. And, yeah, you can you know it probably. Yes, yes. Only three notes or four notes, so I did not play a saxophone concerto, eh? but I yeah. played that. And so they came uh, at home, my uh, father and mother, and I said, "Okay, sit down." And I sit down, and I played do 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 do. So and, and the next day I went to the shop where they b- bought the saxophone and I said, um, I want to have uh, somebody who uh, uh, g- give me lessons. And the man said, yeah, but I can do it. And then after a year he said, no, you, you have to find another guy because I cannot uh, learn you, uh, teach you anymore. Uh, and then uh, I said to my father, okay, I want to do something. I want to be a professional musician. And then, uh, okay, then the whole story starts at the conservatory. It should be noted that since the recording of that episode, Harry's teacher, Mr. Otto, has passed away. I'd like to extend my deepest condolences to all that were affected by his teachings and life and his family. Harry taught many, many bass clarinetists who went on to do great things, including uh, Henry Bach, Laurie Friedman, and Michael Lowenstern, just to name very few. Lori Friedman was someone who I spoke to early on in the podcast and then 
had the chance not only to meet in Calgary, but to play in a master class where she was adjudicating and uh, also to head out to Montreal and speak with her on her home turf, so to speak. I found her conversation to be incredibly compelling. She plays music, which a lot of people would go, whoa, what, what is this? Really kind of uh, borderline strange improvisations with without any sort of melody that will really set you on edge. And I wanted to get inside what she felt about this kind of music and what sort of reaction she was trying to get out of the audience and, and how could those of us who can't relate to it in the same way that others can, how can we get something out of it? How can we understand why it is that people play music like this at all? Lori's answer was absolutely compelling and really turned my appreciation of music on its head. This is Lori Friedman from episode five. A lot of people are expecting to be emotionally moved or to relax at a concert. How would you entice those people and wake their ear up to being able to enjoy this type of music and interaction? Um, well, let me just stop you there because I, I realize um, people expecting to be emotionally moved. That's great, actually. My aspiration is to move people, to touch people, to change people, so that when people have listened to anything I'm playing, that they'll leave kind of going, huh, that's all. Just, huh. You know, um, I don't, I will actually, I would love it if people go, wow, <laughs> or, Ugh! and those people who hate it or who have a very negative, let's say, emotion around it, I'd love to talk to them and not at all defensively. I want to know what is it and I want what I want there. It's already touched them and there, my job is done. Mm -hmm. Negative Emotion is not a negative thing in and of itself. If you can figure out why it, it made you feel that way, um, that's great. That's really, really great. I mean, I, want, I was thinking about this question when you, uh, when you sent me the list of questionnaire. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you that. Okay, you're asking the question. You're playing the devil's advocate here. And I would love for you, Sean, mm -hmm. pretend you're one of those people. You've been to these kinds of shows. You've had that emotion where you're kind of like, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it reminds me of a John Cage quote. Um, he said something like, I've never heard a sound I didn't like. Yeah. And uh, I, I think actually Michael Norsworthy said that the other day. And he sort of mentioned he wasn't sure that felt like a very human reaction to um well we started discussing the philosophy of John Cage at that point um but yeah I mean I, I sort of agree I mean if someone is really um if someone can experience uh, a love emotion or happiness or playfulness or anything like that for music surely some sort of um in some sense almost like a repulsion or immediate lack of understanding that puts them on edge is is it's in some ways equally important I find it extremely important. Uh, any emotion is is a, like a jackpot for inf for for knowledge. I just love the way that Laurie talked about musical emotion in a way I'd never really considered before. I, I a lot of people really want to be, as I was saying, emotionally moved in a way that is positive, and the negative elements of that I had never looked at in that way. And it was just another moment that I, I really was pleased to have experienced in early on in the podcasting journey. In episode 20, Harry Sparnai also talked about how he likes to get his students to strip down all of their gear and play on the bare minimum that they can, um, even to the point of playing, I believe he said, on a garden hose. Daryl Caswell was the first non-clarinetist to come on the podcast. He actually lives in Calgary, and he was of interest to me because he's also uh, the developer of something called the Landwell Reed Knife, which is a proprietary design that has led to, uh, he insists, one of the sharpest possible reed knives there could, there could possibly be. Um, anyways, Daryl shared a really interesting story with me about how he likes to play French horn on the garden hose to elicit an emotional response from his engineering students. In addition to being a fantastic French horn player, a designer of the Landwell reed knife, and many other things, uh, including an instrument repairman, 
Believe it or not, he's also an engineer, and he is an engineering instructor at the University of Calgary. An interesting side note is I had a roommate in university who studied with Daryl, and I remember a day that he came home and told me about this fantastic story, and I was so glad to have the chance to capture it on episode four of the podcast with Daryl Caswell. What I try to do with the engineering students is, is like you say, is, is elevate the level of the musician and the artist in their eyes because they tend to be quite uh, biased about, you know, science is everything and, and arts is just fluff. And so I would say, you know, it really doesn't matter what kind of an instrument I play. It's the years and years and years of practice and learning how to create sound to uh, address or, or elicit emotions from people. And to make that point, I'd say, you know, I play French horn professionally, but, you know, I'm not going to play my horn for you because you'll just think, oh, well, that's a, you know, a $25,000 instrument. Of course, that sounds good. I said, I'm going to show you how much is intellectual and how much is is inside the, the player. So I just pick up and I play a, a garden hose. I play Brahms' uh, first symphony. <laughs> and, you know, the thing about a garden hose is I probably sound better on a garden hose almost than a French horn just because of the acoustical nature of the garden hose. But the thing is that invariably I play that wherever I play on the garden hose, people burst into applause before I'm, I'm finished. And a lot of it is, and I tell them, it's not because it's this odd thing. It's because you finally, because I've taken away the instrument and you can't be impressed with the beauty of the instrument. It's strictly how I structured the phrases that makes you excited, you know. And that's so why I use that all the time to try and show even musicians that, you know, it's what we do inside our heads that and, and how we connect one note to another that makes the music. It's not whether we push the buttons down in the correct order or have a you know a nice fancy instrument to do it with. Talking with Daryl about his read nice was such an incredible insight. Um, and one of the things that Daryl really recommended was that musicians of different types talk to other musicians of unrelated instruments. Um, and he really is sort of a fan of trying to broaden one's perspective. And I think that's fairly evident given the fact that he's an engineer and a professional musician at the same time. Um, so I started thinking, what are some periphery topics which might be of interest to clarinet players? And I realized that a company whose headphones I'd been using for over 10 years called Edimotic Research actually was also developing some amazing hearing protection devices. And I really wanted to get inside what it would be like not only to be working at the company, but also to learn how these kind of products can actually extend the career of a musician. Now, since this recording, I've actually taken their advice very seriously. I wear their Music Pro headphones at almost every opportunity that I can. I use their device called the dosimeter to track the hearing levels in my studio. And since injuring my hands severely, this has become something that I'm, I'm quite passionate about. Um, if, if, if it's one thing to sort of lose your ability to play and sort of like your voice through your, your, your instrument, I can't imagine what it would be like to also lose your hearing or to lose your hearing, but still have the capacity to play. So hearing protection, although it doesn't seem directly related to clarinet, I can't imagine what could be more relevant. This is Patty Johnson from Edimotic Research in episode 14 of the podcast. Audiologists in the past have really gotten stuck on looking at hearing loss. And hearing loss first shows up as a loss of sensitivity for quiet sounds. Um, for a lot of musicians, that's, that really doesn't impact their career significantly because most of what you play is well enough above threshold that it may not have a big impact on you. The, the types of damage that loud sound can do that are really concerning to me as far as musicians go are things dealing with clarity and resolution. High levels of sound can, over time or as a sudden, Im sudden impact, like if, if a speaker blows, you know, if, if you have an amplifier that kind of goes wonky and you have this huge blast of sound – that can damage the ear permanently so that you have problems in pitch perception. And that that's a real problem for musicians, having your pitch perception altered. Things like that can also cause 
things to sound distorted as if if you ever heard um, a blown amplifier, a blown speaker that sounds fuzzy, like it's clipping, that can actually happen to your ear. And those are the things that we want to prevent. Hearing loss too, you know, definitely we want to prevent hearing loss, but there are these other types of damage that people are not readily aware of that are really important to protect against. Um, And the last thing that high levels of sound exposure can cause is ringing in your ears, which we call tinnitus or tinnitus. Either way is okay. Um, Tinnitus can be anything from, oh, I hear it all the time and it doesn't bother me. Well, I personally have that, and I believe it was due to attending concerts in my teens before I knew better, completely unprotected. So I have tinnitus with me all the time. Certain things make it worse. If I take aspirin, it makes it worse. But I know what it is, and it doesn't bother me, and most of the time I can pretty much tune it out. Other people have an experience of tinnitus that runs the range from that all the way to being really life-altering. Some people have tinnitus that's so bad, it never goes away. And so it becomes a quality of life issue that when you are finished performing or finished listening and you go home at night and you want to sleep and you can't sleep because the sound in your head is so annoying and so disturbing, you know, that is another thing we want to prevent by using uh, safe listening practices and by using really good quality hearing protection and good quality earphones. And people need to know more about that. I mean, it's one of those things you don't worry about it until you're worried about it. Um, That's right. You know, if if you even had a little glimpse into what it was like, I think you'd really be a little more careful with it. And you actually, with the concerts, remind me of a situation I had last year. I I bought tickets to a band that I actually would been looking forward to see probably since I was in my teens. Like we're talking a long time. I've always been a huge fan, but I forgot my Eddie plugs at the show, and I was in physical agony actually from listening. I I didn't know how other people were sitting there, and I couldn't believe that they didn't sell any earplugs at the event. I, I tried stuffing toilet paper in my ears. I but I just had to leave because I realized that for one concert I could potentially be really in a situation where I would regret um, years down the line. And it it changed everything. Absolutely. We have measured levels at concerts that are become unsafe in less than five minutes. And many people are sitting there for the main act, maybe 60 to 90 minutes for a show. And, you know, one way to know if the sound it was loud enough to do some damage to your hearing. Well, one rule of thumb is if somebody is an arm's length away and you have to really raise your voice in order to hear each other, it's loud enough that you should be wearing hearing protection. If you've ever had tinnitus, ringing ears, after an exposure, after, some, after loud sound, that means you've done some damage. And that damage is cumulative over time. That's your canary in the mine. That's your early warning signal. And don't let it go. You know, we there was an engineer at audio at I'm sorry, an engineer at Etimotic who went to see U2 in concert, and he was really excited to go. Like you, dashed out the door, went straight from work, forgot his Eddie plugs, and ended up with a really serious temporary loss that resolved over about a month's time. So his hearing thresholds, when we measured them, returned to normal. But he was left with a sensitivity to sound. Now loud sound makes him really uncomfortable where it didn't before. And he has some lingering distortion that loud sounds sound distorted in his ears. And and that will never change. He's left with that now. So for those uh, people who are playing concerts, um, like uh, orchestral musicians and things, uh, I think that the Music Pro are definitely the better option. But for rock concerts and things like that, are the Music Pro still a good choice or would like the, the Eddie plugs be better? That's an excellent question. I'm, I'm really glad you asked that because my preference would be to use the Eddie plugs for a concert. For a concert, you really want 
the the higher level of attenuation that the eddy plugs give you. The Music Pros will give you 15 dB attenuation, and the eddy plugs will give you 20. That 5 dB difference is really significant when you're talking about high sound high sound levels. So, and with the cost of eddy plugs being 12, 13, 14, 15 dollars, it's kind of a no-brainer that whether you have um, custom earplugs or the Music Pros, it's always a good idea to have some Eddie Eddie plugs on hand. And even just things. for the reason of um, the batteries can't fail in the Eddie plugs because there is no battery, and uh, they're so affordable that I mean, if you forget them on your chair at the concert, it's not really a big deal, you know. And and, and one thing um, I want to get back to the battery in just a second because that's important. But one thing that a lot of people are not aware of is that earplugs allow you to hear better at a loud concert like that because at really high sound levels, the ears themselves overload and distort. So if you're attending a concert, whether it's country, western, or rock music, or pop pop music, whatever, whatever kind of music you prefer, chances are it's loud enough that you need earplugs, don't be concerned that you're going to be missing out because actually you'll hear better. The earplugs take down the sound to a level that the ears can handle without overloading and distorting. So going to concerts with earplugs actually makes things sound better. I think that the value Patty brought to the podcast really can't be measured. And I I hope that many, many people will really heed her advice about how to protect your hearing and prolong your career and really protect the investment in not only time, but also money that you've made in in learning an instrument. Um, Really, your body is your instrument, or it's an extension of that anyways. And uh, in season two, I'm actually going to be having a few more conversations similar to that, kind of just about how to... Um, ensure that you're physically fit and able to play, and also how to protect yourself against injury, which has again become an interest of mine since my accident. I also, during the time uh, early on in the podcast season, I had just finished my first album and I was going in, into the mastering studio, the mixing studio, and, and working on that. I had a lot of interest in what it was like making other recordings. One of the most exciting opportunities I had the whole year was speaking with Evan Zaporin, who arguably ignited my passion to record music uh, when I was in university. I remember listening to his version of New York Counterpoint and being so inspired by it that I made my own version um, to play at my recital. We had a rather involved conversation about how he uh, how it was to work with Steve Reich and what it was like recording this piece for the first time. There's a rather funny experience that he uh, discusses regarding snow, and it's interesting to note that when I met him in Calgary, it was May, I believe, 2015, and there was also a giant snowstorm. It seems that the snowstorms just, just follow him around. So this is Evan Zaporin from episode 21, sharing what it was like to work with Steve Reich and record the seminal version of New York Counterpoint. You recorded the definitive version of Steve Reich's New York Counterpoint, um, as well as uh, the music for 18 musicians. And uh, that recording actually won a Grammy uh, the next year. What was it like working with with Reich? Well, uh, he's one of the most influential people on me. And I, you know, I, when I have the perspective to look back on my life, I think like, you know, I really had the opportunity to work with some of my heroes, some of my real, real big heroes, right? And, and he's definitely right up there, you know, so I'm incredibly grateful for that. Like, I had kind of met him through Bang in a Can, and then I invited him, I, I helped uh, get him a small but not insignificant award at MIT in the 90s, which was basically an excuse to bring him up, and I organized, like, a whole bunch of student performances around his music, uh, and at that time, you know, this was 20 plus years ago. So not, again, it was one of these things where weirdly not so many institutions were, you know, celebrating him. So now, you know, I assume he's getting honorary degrees every time he turns around, but at that point it wasn't happening so much. So he came up, he was really generous with his time and I got a bunch of student groups to do, uh, you know, several things, including, um, a, a, you know, a clarinet ensemble to play New York Counterpoint. 
So, you know, with all live musicians. Mm -hmm. And as it turned out, that piece, you know, Stoltzman had commissioned that piece and had done a really, I think, quite a beautiful job with the original recording. And I knew that recording really well. But that recording wasn't on Steve's label and had sort of been buried on Stoltzman's own record with a bunch of other music that didn't really have that much to do with it. I still think it's a really nice recording. But um, as it turned out, Steve had never heard the piece with live players before. And I barely knew him. And he came up to Cambridge and I had all the players, you know, in this fairly small practice room, right? And, uh, you know, Steve came in and we started playing, you know, the opening chords. And, you know, basically he looked like his head was going to explode. Like, I mean, the sound (laughs) was just, but in a good way, like the sound was incredible and he had never heard it live. And so he kind of flipped out. And, you know, I mean, I think we did a really good job, but um, I think a lot of it was really just more that unlike most of his pieces, he hadn't really, you know, he hadn't thought of that piece as a live piece. And that's true of the other counterpoints that he had written up to that point as well. You know, they were written for soloists and, uh, you know, nobody had that, that wave of playing them with live musicians hadn't really taken hold. You know, now people do it all the time, but... Um, at that time, people just hadn't gotten around to it. And I think the reason was, again, because they weren't really so much part of the, you know, the conservatory or academic scene, right? So there weren't that many clarinet teachers with studios of that size or that capability who would think to take that piece on. How, how do people play it live? Because I own the, the score for that, and it really is just a part with the score. Are you able to order parts to rent or something? Yeah, you can rent the parts. Oh, okay. I mean, the other thing about it is that it's kind of unwieldy, uh, you know, uh, no offense to Steve, but it's the parts are written out as if for a multi-track recording. So, like, you know, those those repeating patterns at the beginning, like, you know, when you're the first person up, you know, you have to play that pattern like 7,000 times, you know. Yeah. So we had to do a little reshuffling, you know, we had to do a little reshuffling of the parts so that people wouldn't die, you know. <laughs> but it, but, well, uh, it's interesting. But, and I wanted to ask you actually about the, the recording of the piece because, I mean, I actually made my own little recording of it and my methods were, were my methods. But <laughs> before I tell you my methods, what, what were yours like? I mean, did you loop that stuff? Did you play it all like beginning to well, beginning to I'll end? I'll tell you. Okay, so two things about it before that is just that. So, you know, Steve heard it and then, you know, I said, hey, how come you never you never put that out on Nonesuch? Because usually he would put out like a definitive version of every one of his pieces on Nonesuch. And he said, well, you know, I, I never really had the right player for it. And, you know, I don't, it's kind of the moments pass or whatever, but I'm still looking. So, you know, uh, if you want to give it a try, you know, send me a demo tape. <laughs> <laughs> so I basically, I, I recorded the piece. I auditioned. You know, he had heard us play the piece live. And then I, I put together my own recording of it, you know, uh, with Joel Gordon, who's a fantastic audio engineer that I still work with here and, um, sent it to him. And then he, you know, called me up and he said, all right, you passed the audition. <laughs> wow. And then, uh, he, so we set up this recording session and he had a, at that time and, and, and still to my knowledge worked with a fantastic producer named Judy Sherman who did all his recordings and none such. And, you know, I just got put into the, the Steve Reich machine. They have a way that they do it. So, uh, you know, Steve was produ- uh, Judy was producing and Steve was present. So I wasn't involved in the editing or the mixing of that. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the other anecdotal part of that story was that um, um, we recorded it in January of whatever year it was. I can't remember if it was 95 or 96, but uh, the day we were going to do it, I, I was traveling down to New York and this huge snowstorm hit. Uh, you know, one of these Godzilla-like storms that you know very well from your part of the world. But They're here following what happened, you around. <laughs> yeah. So, no, but this was like a really, like one of these major yeah. shutdown. And I like, you know, I called up Judy, the producer, and I said, you know, they're saying there's this huge storm. I'm supposed to be down in New York by 9 a.m. Tomorrow I was going to come down tonight, you know, on the, the, the plane, the shuttle plane. And she said, no, you have to come now before they close everything. Like just, drop, you know, pack your bag, get to the airport, go now. Right. So I did that. And I, I, I ran to Logan Airport and I got on like this 1 p.m. flight. It's like a 45 minute flight. Right. And it just starting to snow in Boston. 
and it takes off and it flies all the way down to New York and they're sort of circling around LaGuardia and then they go, oh, uh, LaGuardia just shut down. We have to fly back to Boston. <laughs> so we flew back to Boston. At that point, it's like three o'clock and I get off this plane and me and basically everybody on the plane like basically runs for the cab stands and gets in, gets in taxi cabs to the train station and, you know, piles our, ourselves onto the next train to New York, which then is supposed to be like a five hour trip at that time. And basically took like 15 hours because the train kept running into snow blockages and power outages. And so I got in New York at like three 30 in the morning and the whole city was shut down. I was supposed to be in the studio at 9 AM and like, you know, there was not, there was nothing. Right. So I get to my hotel and I, I wait until the sun is up and then like I call them up and they go, yeah, okay, we're giving you the morning off. You can show up at noon. So I show up and we record the piece and then because it was not such and you know, it was all by the books, right? So it was like a union gig, right? So I was being paid like a union scale to do this piece. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I didn't get paid and, uh, you know, so I called the union and I said, what's going on? They said, well, th we think this is a bogus session. Everybody knows the dates on this session were when the entire city was shut down and nothing was going on. So you couldn't <laughs> possibly have been recording this piece on those days. So, so we're not paying you. We straightened it all out and I got paid. But <laughs> I, That's hilarious. That's, those are the things I remember about those, those recordings much more than the actual methods. But what I will say, if you do want to talk about the method, is that it was really during the demo recording that I figured out how to record the piece because you think you know how to make these patterns interlock, right? But And when you're playing like a marimba or a piano or a percussion instrument, it's pretty clear. But on clarinet, at least for me, it turns out like all sorts of calculations I made about like articulation and phrasing didn't necessarily work. Like you need the feedback of some initial recording to kind of go like, okay, how can I really make this phrase sound the way I want it to sound and still lock in with itself as a very small canon or, you know, there was a lot of trial and error and a lot of instincts that I might have used in a live performance turned out I had to re-examine those. Mm -hmm. And there it comes full circle to, uh, to Bali and that connection to the minimalist because I do think that because I had studied these interlocking traditions like Balinese gamelan and also West African drumming that I had much more of an understanding of how you square that circle, how you manage to make lines have autonomy in and of themselves, but still lock in in a fairly metronomic way with the other parts. And that to me is really the key with that music because I've heard a lot of recordings of New York Counterpoint now. And the difference is not how accurate they are, but how much they groove, right? And they you can't do what you normally do to make something groove. Like there's a very small margin of, of, of expression in that music. Mm -hmm. But if you play it totally metronomically, then it just sounds mechanical and that's not what he has in mind and it, and it doesn't work. It still has to have, you have to find the little cracks to put your humanity into it. Over the course of the year, I had the chance to speak with many, many artists about their recording techniques and things that they like about recording, maybe things they don't like about recording. I remember Lori Friedman in particular mentioning that she actually really prefers playing live. And Harry Sparnai actually said <laughs> that he, uh, he liked when the red light would come on and that meant the recording was over and that he could leave. So some artists really, really enjoy being in the studio. I think that myself and Evan Zaporin would be included in that. But others really prefer live performance. Martin Frost is somebody who is comfortable in both domains, um, is arguably the most famous clarinet player in the world right now. And he was someone who I thought, well, maybe one day if I get really lucky, I'll get the chance to speak with him. However, in episode nine, I was surprised when I got in touch with his manager and was able to get him booked for an episode. Um, I want to mention that I'm now working on trying to get him back for season two for a second conversation. At this point in the interview, I had just asked him about a quote which he had mentioned in a YouTube video I'd watched where he mentioned that he didn't think he was a very versatile musician. And I wanted to get him to clarify this and he ended up sharing some really interesting insights into his sort of philosophy on the passage of time and how it relates to music and his new album called Roots. This is Martin Frost from episode 9 of the podcast. 
uh, versatile could be like you are very broad as an artist you can do everything and you just do it i think i always go out on a, on on a, on a, on a side on the on a wide side or, or going on on the edge what i'm sometimes not so good at i mean if i meet an artist or meet a, a composer i try always to challenge myself which is also a part of my education because I, if I only do things that I feel comfortable, I would be in big trouble because that's how I work as, as an artist. I um, I like to be um, searching out in different fields that I'm, I'm not so comfortable in. Mm-hmm. I don't know why I'm doing that, but um, and I think it's just different. Yeah. Sorry. Would you say the versatility kind of depends on one's perspective? Then I mean, for you, this is like the clarinet. Obviously, is your life, and these things—the new repertoire, the old repertoire—that kind of is the clarinet. So maybe it doesn't to you seem versatile, even though to some people it may seem that way. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe because I people think I get that question sometimes as well. Do you want to break the rules or, or you know try to? But, but that's never has never been any to, to just break codes for what we do. I mean, I could be provoked by all all the rules that we are sort of what is what is what is classical music and what is modern and what is uh, this kind of way of thinking. But in the same time, um, I'm quite traditional in my thinking. I when I go to concert, I. I Love to to have an overture and a concerto and, and, and a symphony and just uh, shut up and mm-hmm. listen. But if I do that a lot, uh, then then I get an urge to, to, to do something else. And um, it, it's the same. I think everything is in the same. Um, for example, if you take clarinet techniques, mm-hmm. I. I um, find out that uh, in the same way I'm getting excited or, or interested or curious in, in doing as in recording here, the latest recording I have, singing and playing in a new technique. I don't know if you heard that. Oh yeah, and, definitely. Uh, that is a sort of, I, I, I circular breathing and then I relax my, my vocal cords and I can sing and I wanted to, to do that in concert and I also do the beatboxing which was a coincidence or an accident when I realized that could be uh, uh, actually done on live and even in the mic works very well. So um, I am curious to find new ways and that makes me maybe versatile, I don't know, but I don't I, I, I see myself as going on different journeys to make myself more uh, complete as an artist and as a, as a musician. The same, the same thing with conducting or, or just directing an orchestra, which I do because I like it, but also it gives me uh, lots of things as, as a clarinet player when I come back to playing a, a normal concerto by Nielsen or Mozart and having a conductor besides me. I have learned a lot doing all these things by, by myself with a, directing an orchestra. So. Perhaps one other reason you don't feel it's particularly versatile when you look at the new repertoire um, versus the old. I mean, some people put a very clear line there, but to the roots a concept again, time is, is very smooth. It never, it never stops. There are no breaks. Great. So Great. You maybe you connect Perfect. back. That, that's what Roots about. The whole Genesis project or the Roots project is exactly by that. I put uh, on the shield bar new first performance beside Greek hymns. And you can hear, you know, mm-hmm. actually I play the hymn within his piece. And then going into Hildegard and then coming from uh, Telemann into Piazzolla. And it's like putting the music upside down and just continue playing. It's actually very related. All the music that is we hear and also when I listen to a, 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 let's say a first performance or even if you hear a piece by let's say Lotus Lafsky or you can hear the whole music history be behind that composer in that piece it's like layer on layer that you, you hear how the vibration of the whole music is there so I think everything is here and now mm-hmm. whatever you do and maybe that makes me versatile but I I think the time is over then when you when you really have to say I see sometimes very right oh I have done a lot of modern music but in the same time I record all the repertoire that I think is 
great repertoire in the past. That was what I had to do. I played 99% all the, uh, the clarinet repertoire. And then I do projects, which I think is interesting. And I, of course, I did first performance. But that's one of the most important things to do. I mean, represent your own time and try to develop new repertoire. But I don't uh, segregate. I don't, how do you say, I don't split them up. I think mm-hmm. they are linked together, as you said. Well, and it makes sense to do mostly older repertoire because there's mostly been the past, you know? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but uh, also in the Roots project, I think we are into something important now in this discussion because I think also what the Roots was all about, the Roots project, now the Genesis project, which is called in, in, in sometimes when I do it live, it is around uh, all the sources that is important for us the the sacred source the profane source the the improvisation for example i also use in this i'm not an uh, improviser myself but i i I also develop some improvisation in the concert because all of course that has been an important part of the music history if you look at bach uh, mozart beethoven he was a great improviser and mendelssohn and all these kinds of Mm -hmm. people they they were improvising now it's not that common in classical music that we do and of course it's good to 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 develop all these things for me because I get to know repertoire better. I, I want to be more complete as an artist. So I, I, that's my education nowadays. I've done all the repertoire. I, I cannot, uh, when, when I look back in the back mirror now, I, I'm certainly, I, I certainly don't want to see myself as only a traditional clarinet play, which did uh, 1,500 Weber concertos and, and 2,000 Mozart concertos. Is that what it's to, up to now? Are those real numbers? No, no, no sorry, I exaggerated. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe 500 or something like that. But yes. I also did the Hilbert concerto 300 times or something wow. like that. So, but I think that it's what we should do is open new doors into this future. That's what we, we, we have to do in classical music today. And I think uh, if it... You know, if it's develop new clarinet techniques, or if it's de- developing new repertoire, speak to a composer who wants to do something differently. Now, that's everything. All these things trust me on, and I want to, to be part of that. Speaking of the roots of music and versatility, Ed Joffe had to be one of the most compelling guests that I had on all year. I realized during the interview that I was only about a third of the way through my questions, and we had already been talking for more than an hour and a half. So, over the next couple of days, Ed and I got together and recorded a three-episode series where I ensured that I was able to touch on as many elements of his career as possible. It's worth noting that Ed has a fantastic YouTube video series and podcast himself where he talks about all sorts of aspects of woodwind playing. This is Ed Joffe from episode 18 discussing the roots of doubling, the direction that doubling took throughout the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, as well as some of the value that all doublers seem to glean from learning clarinet. What do you think life was like for a a musician in, say, Mozart's orchestra back then? Right, right. it's also the 18th and 19th centuries. That was uh, commonplace for oboists especially to uh, play recorders and to play flutes and in cases, in some cases, for uh, bassoonists to play flute as well. Uh, That was where the doubles happened. So, uh, you know, when I began uh, writing this book and trying to put a historical section together, I thought I was just going to go back to the days of Paul Whiteman in the 1920s who had, you know, wooden sections where you know, the three wind, the three initial wind players played numerous uh, instruments, and in fact, the, the famous clarinet player Russ Gorman, who played the Rhapsody in Blue Smear on the initial recording, played something like twelve, fifteen, eighteen instruments at every Gershwin concert. Uh, you know, it was ridiculous. So that was my idea of where the history of woodwind doubling happened. But I found out <laughs> shortly thereafter that no. Uh, even going back to the time of Bach, uh, woodwind doubling, in other words, playing a lot of wind instruments, including brass instruments, was common fare. Uh, in Germany, there was a history of a type of uh, a musician called the Stadtpfeifer, who was basically a town musician that would you know, go from town to town and play for various ceremonial uh, affairs. And they would be responsible for playing any type of woodwind or brass instrument. 
and Bach's family, his lineage, had numerous uh, relatives of his who were Stadtpfeifers. And old J.S. himself was probably destined to be a Stadtpfeifer had not he uh, been relocated to Leipzig and happened to be, uh, you know, a few doors down from a church with a magnificent organ. Uh, otherwise, we might not have some of the great <laughs> music today. I mean, if he had stayed, at, at, you know, in his and stayed at home and not moved to his relative's home in Leipzig, uh, who knows? Bach would have been a Stadtpfeiffer that we would never have heard of again. Yeah. Uh, but these were uh, town musicians that were popular throughout much of Europe. And it carried forward uh, into the time of Joseph Haydn. And, and so many of Haydn's early symphonies, and with uh, specific ones like number 9 and 24, have situations where the first and second movement, you have two oboes. This was during the time of his apprenticeship or his work at Esterhazy. And it was a very small orchestra. They never, never really got above 25 musicians. And so the two oboe players were very prevalent in those times. And that's, in fact, why the oboe gives the A, because in, you know, with a group of 25 and you have two oboes, they're cutting right through mm -hmm. the orchestra. And, and so they were among the loudest instruments in being heard in the orchestra. Anyway, those two oboists that Haydn wrote for uh, also had the ability to play flute and recorders. And so in order to change up the color and to change the nature of the movements in the third movements of Symphonies 9 and 24, those two oboes suddenly disappear and suddenly you have two flutes. And back in the fourth movement, suddenly two oboes reappear. Well, <laughs> uh, Haydn didn't waste, uh, you know, two flute players sitting there not playing the first, second and fourth movements. They were the same guys. Uh, and Mozart similarly made use of oboes and flutes that way and some of his early symphonies, like 6, 9, 12, uh, 14, and 24, if I recollect correctly, as well as numerous other instrumental uh, works. Uh, so this was not uncommon. Uh, and even bringing into the 19th century, you know, Adolf Sax, who obviously created the saxophone and the bass clarinet, by the way, uh, was an exceptional, according to everything we've read about him, exceptional flutist and clarinetist. Mm -hmm. And so when he opted to take up the challenge of developing the saxophone, uh, he made use of his knowledge of both the single reed and uh, the flute. Uh, so the saxophone, in a sense, mimics both instruments uh, a, a little bit, uh, certainly in the fingerboard of the flute and certainly in the single reed concept of the clarinet. So, you know, the idea of multiple woodwind players is nothing new. It's It just took on a different form in 20th century America as, uh, you know, the dance bands and jazz bands evolved into the late teens after uh, World War One and the 20s. Um, and, of course, uh, Paul Whiteman's band was probably the uh, high point of that and uh, mm -hmm. emphasizing that. But it's a long history of multiple woodwind players. Now, to the point of the clarinet, and again, I'm not saying this because we're on a clarinet podcast, but the clarinet is the most difficult of the single reeds. I, I can't speak to the oboe and bassoon because I don't play them, but clarinet, flute, and saxophone family of instruments, the clarinet is by far the most difficult. Uh, one, because it's a cylindrical bore and uh, as compared to the conical bore of the saxophone and flute. Um, therefore, uh, the clarinet lacks every other overtone and that makes it harder to get a sound that is, you know, balanced in resonance and in overtones. Uh, secondly, the clarinet overblows a twelfth uh, from its basic stack in the first few registers and this flute and clarinet excuse me, the flute and saxophone overblow an octave. So the fingerings are different on the clarinet from one register to the other. So that also makes it more difficult. Um, a third reason, I think, uh, simply is that, you know, the clarinet, uh, most clarinets that we know have open holes uh, in fingerings for their basic stack. And, you know, the saxophone particularly has pearls, so it's a closed hole instrument. So you have to be much more precise on the clarinet and the fingering. And the final reason, which may be the most important of all, is that most clarinets are made of wood, whereas most saxophones and flutes are uh, metal. And as we know, wood is 
very susceptible to temperature and humidity changes. And, uh, you know, that results in many problems with regard to pitch and, of course, with our reeds, response of the reeds. Uh, so for all those reasons, I think the clarinet is by far the hardest instrument of certainly the, uh, the instruments that I play. But here's a little, here's a great little uh, anecdote. Uh, Frank West, who was one of the greatest saxophonists and flutists of all time and a uh, uh, member of the Basie Band, and perhaps, in my opinion, the greatest jazz flute player overall. Um, Frank didn't like the clarinet very much, especially because he was such a, a heavy flute player. So he said, he used to say, you know, the clarinet is designed by five different people in five different cities, working at five different times, none of whom know each other or communicate. That was, that's how he, he viewed the difficulty of playing the clarinet. It was, <laughs> it was, you know. But you know, the truth is, to play the clarinet well, uh, you can't hide. There are certain instruments and certain instruments in, a, in certain families that you can get away with a lot. Maybe you're not going to have an embouchure or, or an understanding of an embouchure that's so precise. Maybe uh, there are enough overtones to disguise the fact that the, fo the pitch isn't as focused as it should be or the concentration of sound isn't as focused as it should be. On the clarinet, there's no hiding. Not one area of the instrument uh, is just something you can put in your mouth and blow and it's going to sound great. You have to work at it. And I think those players who generally had a background in clarinet, who then maybe gravitate to saxophone uh, and also have a good concept of what they want the saxophone to sound like, will sound better as a result of that background on clarinet. Uh, and, you know, if we look at some of the greatest jazz saxophone players in recent times, for instance, let's take the two greatest, perhaps two greatest tenor players of the last 50 years, John Coltrane and Michael Brecker. Both of those gentlemen had clarinet first as an instrument uh, and then gravitated to alto saxophone and then ultimately tenor saxophone. But clarinet was the first woodwind that entered their mouth. And I absolutely believe that in some way helped them along the line uh, in evolving their uh, sounds and their fluency. Uh, there's also no hiding on the clarinet technique. Certain instruments are a little easier, specifically uh, flute and saxophone in this sense. You overblow an octave. So a great deal of the primary fingerings, by adding an octave key or in the case of the flute, perhaps lifting a top finger up, you will get the, uh, the octave without too much effort. The clarinet, no way. Uh, especially octaves, you're using a different fingering and overblowing a twelfth, it just doesn't happen automatically. I mean, you there's a, a lot more demand physically to play the clarinet well and to play it well over a long period of time and for many years than there is, in my opinion, for saxophone and flute. That's not to say that flute and saxophone are easy, but the clarinet is hard. It's a demanding instrument. And uh, you lay off the clarinet one or two days, you're not coming back at full strength. I mean, it's an instrument you have to be at every single day. Uh, and, of course, the reeds add that other component of difficulty. Um, so I think people who play the clarinet first who have a desire to also play other woodwind instruments and other types of music as, in a sense, doublers have an advantage. Uh, rather than those who perhaps start on saxophone or start on flute and then pick up clarinet later on. It's rare that you see them develop on clarinet in a very good way. I, I know many school yeah. programs here actually start students on, on clarinet, and then if they want to, they can sort of audition on saxophone the next year. And I, I think because of what you just talked about, I think that's a great thing. Yeah, that, and, that um, was a and that was the tradition because the clarinet was – uh, especially in the 30s and the 40s, was was the instrument. It was the guitar of that era. I mean, Benny Goodman, Audie Shore, they were the rock stars, and the clarinet was the instrument. And as a result, a lot of generations came up uh, with the clarinet as their, you know, the pop instrument of the day, not just the classical instrument of, of woodwinds to play. It was the pop instrument of the day, and I think that influence lasted many generations. It's hard and, to imagine uh, now, though. It sure is. <laughs> but, uh, 
But look, <laughs> there's a lot of things that, that are hard to imagine that are happening now. Absolutely. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but thankfully, there has been a resurgence in uh, clarinet in, in regard to uh, writing and commercial music. And certainly, uh, more and more people are establishing themselves as uh, clarinet soloists in various parts of the world. I, I noticed in one of your last podcasts, you had Martin Frost, who I think is just the end. And one of the greatest musicians we have going in the world today, irregardless if he played clarinet or not. One element I'd experimented with throughout the year of the podcast was inviting listeners to submit questions. With some artists like Martin Frost, I had over 50 questions submitted And, of course, there was no way for me to get through them all. So, with Michael Lowenstern on episode 32, I decided to turn things around completely and have listeners ask all the questions. People submitted questions from all over the world, and this was actually pretty tough for me because Michael Lowenstern was one of those guests that I really, really wanted to talk to myself. And so, I felt like I really have to have him back at some point to to continue the conversation. I'm happy to say that he has agreed to do that, and I did have the chance to meet him when I was in Kansas at Clarinet Fest 2016. This is Michael Lowenstern sharing some of his thoughts on what he wished he'd known as a younger musician. What do you wish to tell young musicians and clarinetists who are students or emerging professionals? Uh, some of you who have ever seen me talk about this live, this will sound familiar to you. But um, for those of you who haven't, the one thing that I wish that um, maybe a teacher told me when I was in college, I was in a conservatory, so I was among some of the best muse- musicians in the country. Uh, I wish somebody told me that you don't have to make a living as a musician, to be a musician. Um, Because when I left music, it was a real struggle, 10 or 11 years ago, when I decided to switch gears, really, uh, it was a real struggle for me to come to grips with the fact that I felt like I was selling out or I was giving up. And now looking back at it, uh, having been doing what I'm doing now for 10 years, it has been the most productive, fun, satisfying um, way of experiencing music. And I'm so glad I made the change. It's not for everybody. Um, obviously advertising is not for everybody and leaving music as a full-time thing is not an option for everybody. But for me, it just knowing ha- that I didn't have to have a career in music to be a musician is something that I really wish somebody had told me sooner. That's so interesting to me because haven't most of your major works come out in the last 10 years, like your, your CDs? Uh, more than half of them. Yeah. Yeah. So like, it's been just as prolific, if not more. Um, so it's, it's, it's just interesting to me that way. Yeah. Do you think that allows you to kind of take a break mentally and come back to it and and do it for yourself more? Totally. And it also allows me to not have to rely on, um, playing music that I don't want to play. Yeah. And yeah. And, and to answer one of Tony's other questions, sort of, I, I was not enjoying playing in an orchestra. It is a, it is kind of a repressive thing for me, where I had to do not just what the conductor told me to do, but I had to do what the principal player told me to do, and I had to do what the first oboist would suggest that I do because I was playing bass clarinet. I don't really have, I, I never had the option to make the decisions of how I wanted to play a piece of music. Everything was decided for me and I had to just execute it. It's just not what I was into. Well, I think a lot of people actually have sort of a, I don't know, if, when they do start playing with orchestras, if, if they realize that it's not for them, they almost feel guilty or lost because they went to school thinking that was the goal. And then they sort of find out that it's, it's just not them. I mean, what, what would you say to those people? Um, well, uh, hopefully they hear me now. Um, but it, you know, it, you got to do what you enjoy. Um, if playing in an orchestra is the only way for you to make a living, then you have to, you know, either if you can't make, if you can't get out of it, um, make the best of it and find other outlets for yourself. I certainly know a lot of other, a lot of orchestral clarinet players, and I will not name any of them. They have wonderful lives outside of the orchestra and they're able to do music and they're able to do things outside of music. Some of them uh, are repair people. Some of them make mouthpieces. Uh, a lot of them teach. So they find um, sort of their voice, as it were, outside of the orchestra and the orchestra is a way for them to sort of practice their craft, uh, mm-hmm. which is always a good thing to be able to do. Yeah, no, I'm not discounting the orchestra. I think a lot of people really like playing with the orchestra, but a lot of people, not only do they find out it's not for them, but they also find that even if they want it so badly, there's not a job for them. 
So because well, I heard somebody say it's actually uh, it's easier to to become president of the United States than it is to get a flu job because um, at least the pre- <laughs> at least the presidency opens up every four years. A lot of listeners wrote in and expressed how much Michael's words on this episode meant to them. And I have to say that they actually meant a lot to me, too. As someone who has been pursuing, obviously, this podcast throughout the last year, there were many moments where I sort of looked and thought, hmm, I wonder if this is actually helping my playing or if it's somehow detracting from my playing career. But it's okay to do things that aren't directly associated with music, and sometimes I find that when I go back to playing or or doing music, it actually means more to me than if I'd just been sort of working at it all day. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with being full-time players, but there's simply not enough positions in the world today for everybody to do that. And I think that there's no reason in order to be an artist that you have to do music full-time. Artistry can exist in smaller chunks, and it can even be assisted by things that are not directly the art itself. And this is, I think, what I really learned this year. And my last favorite moment I'd like to talk about was the fact that I, I had no idea I would connect with so many podcasters throughout being a podcaster. And that seems a little odd to think about. But when you're podcasting, you're isolated, you're in your house, you're in my case, in the basement by yourself, sort of putting things out into the void. And one of the greatest aspects of this whole year was connecting with five other podcasters, Jason Heath of the Contrabass Conversations podcast, Hugh Sung of the A Musical Life podcast, Garrett Hope of the Portfolio Composer podcast, Dennis Tobensky of, he actually has several podcasts, I'll link to all these in the show notes, and also Seth Haynes, and there's actually a couple others. So there's an amazing community of music podcasters now, and you may not realize, but we all meet on pretty much a weekly basis to talk about how to do this job better, how to sort of learn from each other and and take this to the next level. And it's been so great having the chance to network with them. One of my favorite moments then was actually getting together with Jason Heath from the Contrabass Conversations podcast and talking about what it was like at the end of the first year of podcasting. Sort of just taking a look back about some of the things that I'd learned and some of the places I wanted to go in the future. And for the first time, addressing the question of why. Why was this a medium I was drawn to and why a clarinet podcast at all? Here's Jason Heath from episode 46 talking to me about exactly that. Why a podcast? Like, I know of all the things you could have done with your time or directions you could have pursued, what was it that attracted you to the podcasting medium? Um, I think it was simply the fact that I'd I'd listened to so many. And once I realized, um, there's a Steve Jobs quote, actually, that I, I can't remember verbatim right now, but he says something like, um, if you were to lo- if you were to n- realize that all the things out there are just done by by real people, you would you would do them mm-hmm. like and I, I wish I could remember it more exactly. Maybe I'll try and send you a link to it. But it just really sort of resonated with me one time. I, I did realize like, wait a second, all the books that have been written, all the things that have been done, all these things are done by people. And that sounds like such a stupid thing to realize, but it's true. And any person can really do what they feel like doing. Um, and I was at sort of a crossroads where I was realizing that I, I didn't want to be a full-time orchestral player. I uh, was no longer in a position where I felt like going back to school, although it, you know, it's always open, of course. Um, but, you know, it's a lot of money and it's a lot. Of, I, I'm not, I'm married. I'm in my 30s now. I don't feel like packing up and moving across the country sure. just to get a master's. <laughs> right. Right. So anyways, long story short, the podcast medium just felt natural to me. It felt like something that I wanted to get into. It felt like something I wanted to do. And most of all, I felt the very real need for the podcast. Um, and so I wanted to fill that need. I felt like I was the audience that a podcast like this could serve mm-hmm. and that there must be at least, you know, a thousand or 10,000 people yeah. like me that would listen to it. So I well, just went with it. Well, and that's the best reason to start a podcast or start anything, I think, is scratching your own itch. You know, that's, yeah. that if, if, if you make a show trying to appeal to anybody, you'll appeal to nobody. If you at least try to make a show that appeals to you, you've at least got an audience of one. So there you have it. There's what I consider to be my list anyways of the top 10 moments from season one of the podcast. I'm sure there were many more. And if you have any differing ideas or thoughts on that, be sure to share them in the show notes at clarinet.com. 
Thanks so much for listening and be sure to tune in on Thursday, February 16th for the start of season two of the Clarinet podcast. I'm happy to announce that the theme music is actually performed by Michael Lowenstern. And if you've listened to his latest album, you'll probably recognize it. Thanks so much. And I'll see you on Thursday. Thanks for listening to the Clarinet podcast. If you'd like the chance to win items mentioned on the show, please be sure to head to www.clarinet.com and subscribe with your email address to our mailing list. You'll also receive free content updates, coupons, and more directly to your inbox. If you're enjoying the show, please consider subscribing and leaving a rating and review on iTunes or wherever you happen to listen. If you'd like to support the show directly, you can purchase your new and neat clarinet items at the Clarinet online store at clarinet.com slash store. Or you can become a backer on Patreon at clarinet.com slash Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Today's episode was brought to you by our sponsor, Diderio Woodwinds. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, D'Addario is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques, so you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from D'Addario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com woodwinds.